In any case, today we have two things to talk about. The divine ecstasis, the divine ecstasy, and hierarchy. Those are the two things. Ecstasy and hierarchy. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> one sounds like fun. The other one sounds ugh. But that's the thing. They're tied to one another. I want to start out by just reading you a quote of Coakley's. A quote that Coakley, no, a passage from the Pseudo Dionysius that Coakley herself quotes. That's what I'm trying to say. It's on page 314. <coughs> it's just a quote from um, Pseudo Dionysius's uh, Divine Names. The divine yearning brings ecstasy, so that the lover belongs not to the self, but to the beloved. This is why the great Paul, being swept along by his yearning for God, and seized of its ecstatic power, had these inspired words to say, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul was clearly a lover, and as he says, he was beside himself for God. To be beside yourself is to be in ecstasy. Ecstasy is our English version of a Greek term, ecstasis. To be in an ecstatic state is to be outside yourself beyond yourself, beside yourself. Ecstasy already feels ambivalent when we think about it, I think. From the very beginning, it seems ambivalent, ambiguous, has the potential for both pleasure and pain. Ecstasy, when I think of it immediately, I think of pleasure. To be in ecstasy would seem to be feeling really, really good. But to be beside yourself, if you think about ecstasy in that way, the way that Pseudo Dionysius just said Paul was, to be beside yourself in love, you can be beside yourself with love, but we also say that I am beside myself with grief. Right? That's also a way that we talk. We are, there's something about us there's something about who we are as human creatures that is ecstatic. Just be human beings qua human beings. This is not quite what Coakley says. I'm trying to distill it in a certain way to make some sense of it. There's something about human beings that is just ecstatic by nature. I think that there's actually good cause for saying that human beings are just ecstatic by nature because... Coakley says that desire is a constitutive feature of what it means to be a human being. Desire being this Greek word, eros. The same word from which, same root from which we get our word erotic. So keeping this thought about ecstasy, being beside oneself, some of the ambivalence in mind. We need to talk about eros versus the other sort of love, agape. These are the two sorts of love that theologians like to fight about. Um, these are not the only Greek words for love. These are not the only sorts of love, but these are the two that theologians fight about. Um, Coakley makes reference to a famous book, a justly famous book, by a Lutheran scholar named Andrews Nigren. And Nigren argued that Eros was pagan. I don't think that's too pejorative. Eros is fallen, pagan. Agape is Christian. Eros is yearning or desire. <coughs> Agape is self-giving. 
perhaps even self-forgetting. It's like neighbor love. The idea, Nygren said, was that Christianity initiated a revolution in the way of thinking about love. Heretofore, particularly in the world influenced by Greek philosophy like Plato, like Plato's, um, eros had been the focus. Those of you who read the symposium, um, that'll be very familiar to you. Obsessed with this idea of eros. Jesus, though, invites us into a different way of thinking about love. A love that's not trying to fill a lack in us. A love that's not yearning, but a love that gives of itself. That's generally the idea that Nygren is trying to work with. There have been a whole host of theologians, though, who have complicated his thesis, who have said, not only is there a genuinely Christian vision for Eros, not only is Eros not left behind in the transition from Platonism to Christianity or from, the, from Hellenistic philosophy into Christian philosophy, but also the disjunction, the division, the separation of Eros and Agape is just too easily won in Nigram's work. It's just more complicated than he makes it sound. To say that Agape is self-given Eros is yearning might initially sound like Eros is like a vacuum cleaner and agape is like you're pouring something out. But Eros and agape are often not thought of as being that easily distinguishable from one another, in, particularly in these early theologians, theologians like Pseudo-Dionysius. So, for example, Gregory of Nyssa, another one of Sarah Coakley's darlings, um, she doesn't quote this here, but Gregory of Nyssa says that eros is simply agape straining in desire. It's like agape that's being strained out. It's being, it's like you've tethered your agape love to something that's a long way away from you. Like, I don't know, God. And then the strain, it just it stretches and changes the agape. But they're not fundamentally two different sorts of love. It's not like one is the color blue and one is the color brown. It's more that both are modes of the same sort of love. Does that make some sense? It's hard to, it's a little hard to, um, it's a little hard to state, but Nigren's thesis has had a real influence on not simply Christian theology, but on the church. If Christian love is primarily agape rather than eros, it would seem that sexuality has basically nothing to offer one's life with God. That would seem to be a more Augustinian vision we were talking about last time. Although Augustine has quite a bit to say about eros. He just doesn't think that the eros for God is that easily translatable into eros for human beings. But to easily divide agape from eros is to risk suggesting that Christian love is all about love other than sexual love. And sexual love is just something you're supposed to sit over here and control. Coakley, of course, doesn't want to, doesn't want to say that because her whole project is about how sexuality, sexual desire, makes its way into divine desire and is transformed thereby. How our sexualities are caught up in our redemption. So she doesn't want to say that. But I think she also shows us persuasively that a lot of early theologians don't want to say that either. Dionysius has another great quote that she shares with us on the bottom of 313. So Dionysius acknowledges that to ascribe eros not simply to the relationship between human beings and God, to say that we have erotic love for God. Not only is that shocking, but it's even more shocking what he does, which he says God has erotic love for us and for God's self. He admits this is shocking. Okay? He knows 
Even he knows just how weird this might sound. But he says at the bottom of 313, the fact is that men are initially unable to grasp the simplicity of the one divine yearning, the one divine eros. And hence, the term is quite offensive to most of them. To say that God has eros is initially offensive to most people. It's like, wait, what? Why? How? Even if we haven't read Anders Nygren, there is something about our puritanical sensibilities that just bristles at the idea that God would have erotic love. So it is left to the divine wisdom, which Coakley says is the spirit there in the bracket, to lift them and to raise them up to a knowledge of what yearning really is, after which they no longer take offense. Isn't that bold? He goes on to say, It is clear to us that many lowly men think there is something absurd in the lovely verse, Love for you came on me like love for women. To those listening properly to the divine things, the name love is used by the sacred writers in divine revelation with the exact same meaning as the term yearning. What is signified is a capacity to effect a unity, an alliance, and a particular commingling in the beautiful and the good. The idea is that Eros yearns for union. That's what Eros is. Eros is a yearning for union, a yearning for that sort of commingling. So human sexual love is one form of Eros. There's also a divine form of Eros. The question for Coakley is how you get your human Eros into divine Eros. How do you align them? How does this work in God's case? So in 314, at the bottom, another quote from Dionysus. It must be said, too, that the very cause of the universe in the beautiful, good, superabundance of his benign yearning for all is also carried outside of himself in the loving care he has for everything, he here being God. So God is carried outside of God's self in the loving care that God has for all of creation. God is beside God's self. He is, as it were, beguiled by goodness. God being beguiled? What in the world? And there's some real philosophical uh, problem, or potential problems raised by that sort of language of being beguiled. Um, can, can God be enticed by creation in some way? Anyway, so he's, he's stretching the metaphor, right? He is, as it were, beguiled by goodness, by love, and by yearning, and is enticed away from his transcendent dwelling place and comes to abide within all things. And he does so by virtue of his supernatural and ecstatic capacity to remain, nevertheless, within himself. God goes out while remaining in God's self. God stands beside God's self. This is God's ecstasy, God's eros. What is so shocking is that Dionysius has applied ecstasy and eros to God in order to make sense of God's love for us. God's love is not just agape. God's love is not just this, not what Nigrin was describing as self-giving. God's love also yearns. If nothing else, I think we can read that and say something like, O oh Lord my God, and I am awesome wonder, um, start singing How Great Thou Art or something like that. There is something seriously gorgeous about using that sort of language. So there are, there are three things that she wants for us to note about Dionysius' discussion of divine ecstasy. These are on page 316. They're in this long paragraph. The first is that it seems an awful lot like what we were calling the incorporative trinity except it's not giving Trinitarian grammar, right? So in those, in those block quotes from the divine names on 314 and 315, he never names the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the movement seems to be an awful lot, like what we were calling the incorporative trinity. To remind you, the Father has a divine desire, and 
the spirit stirs up the human heart and it is returned to God through the Son. The Spirit prays within us and sighs too deep. The words, it's, it's um, uh, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is God's Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's this reflexivity to this Trinity. Y'all remember this? The Father, you get caught up in this Trinitarian going out and coming back in. That's an awful lot like what Dionysius is saying when he says that God is yearning on the move. Isn't that lovely? God is yearning on the move. Simple, self-move, self-acting, pre-existent in the good, flowing out from the good onto all that is and returning once again to the good. The divine yearning shows especially its unbeginning and unending nature, traveling in an endless circle through the good, from the good, in the good, to the good. Unerringly turning, ever on the same center, always proceeding, always remaining, always being restored to itself. In ecstasy, being outside of God's self. Being beside. Be, I don't want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being beside God's self. That's fine. Being beside God's self. It looks an awful lot like this. But Dionysius doesn't describe it using the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Coco doesn't think it's that big of a jump, though, to go ahead and describe it using Father, Spirit, and Son. The second thing is that Dionysius is unable, in virtue of his platonic commitment, she writes, fully to align sexual eros and divine eros. Though he is also, in virtue of his platonic commitments, quite clear that physical desire finds its origins in right divine desire. And this is a point she's been trying to make throughout the book, that Freud is turned on his head in this way of thinking about desire. So Freud thinks that all talk about God is really about sex. Coakley says that all talk about sex is really talk about God. That's, that's, the, that's the reversal. And this has to do with Freud's own Platonism, Freud's own um, theological narrative. In any case, that's what I'm trying to do. So uh, our talk about sex is a potent reminder woven into our earthly existence of the divine unity, alliance, and commingling that we seek. That's what she says. Then she clarifies, no one can move simply from earthly physical love to divine love unless it is via a Christological transformation. We have to remember what she did in the first chapter, uh, in the prelude. You guys remember this? As the Spirit stirs up, the, as the Father through the Spirit stirs up these desires in our hearts, and as they make their way back to God, they get shot through the crucifixion. And so these desires are chastened. She's not trying to say that anything goes. God is not just stirring up desire to stir up desire. God is trying to transform that desire. Desire that is misdirected is redirected, rightly oriented, rightly ordered. She says that our sinful desires are broken on the hardwood of the cross. That's one of the things she says. Or I can't remember if she says it or if I said it, if that was the way that I made it up. <laughs> In any case, it's supposed to be by virtue. Of the, it's supposed to be by virtue of the, our entrance into the mystery of the crucifixion. And I think I might have explained that on the first couple of days of being broken against the hardwood of the cross. I have this idea that, like the, like, the cross for her is like a strainer. And, like, you know, and it's like, um, yeah, it's like a strainer. Yeah. It's like she's, um, she's sifting for gold or whatever at one of those amusement parks, right? And you have to shake out all the stuff. And the shaking is... Purgation. I'm, I'm reminded of that um, that uh, that uh, that aria from Messiah. And I will share. And I will share. All nations. I'll shake all nations. All something, 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 something. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah. So it's talking about God shaking things. I think you can think of it that way. God's the cross for Coakley is like a strainer. Purgation is like a strainer. You have to. Whether you think of it as God breaks sinful desires on the hard, hard wood of the cross or God is straining out our sinful desires or something like that, there has to be a Christological transformation of our desires because they are not rightly ordered as they currently are. That's what she's saying. Whew. All right, so that's enough. Now that I've sung. <laughs> the third thing 
is that ecstasis allows an implicit acknowledgement of love across difference. And here, she has this beautiful quote from Lucia Rigore at the bottom of 317. We start in the middle of it. This autistic, egological, solitary love, she's talking about the love according to this philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas, who she doesn't like. This autistic, egological, solitary love does not correspond to the shared outpouring, to the loss of boundary of the skin into the mucous membranes of the body, leaving the circle which encloses my solitude to meet in a shared space, a shared breath. In this relation, we are at least three each of us which is irreducible to any of the others, you, me, and our creation, that ecstasy of our self in us prior to any child. What Rigore is saying there is that in human commingling, in human erotic love, there are not just two, there are three. There is you, there is the beloved, the lover, and their ecstasy. That creation in them of themselves prior to any child, prior to any physical embodiment of their relationship, of their commingling. This is interesting to Coakley because it seems like human ecstasy has a triune nature, just as God's ecstasy does. And she equates that ecstasy of our self in us prior to any child, that space, with the Holy Spirit itself. If you guys remember on the first day, where we went over this, I drew another picture on the board. There's, there's two human beings, and I said that the Spirit united them while distinguishing them. Unites them while making sure they don't overwhelm one another. The, the Holy Spirit is both the means of union and commingling and the means of protecting your difference from one another. It takes two eyes to make a we, I had a pastor tell me once. If you get rid of any of the eyes, you're no longer a we, you're just one big eye. It takes two eyes to make a we, and Coakley, I think, might add, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the really, the, the bad way to think about this, this is not what she means. She doesn't mean that, like, um, uh, I was watching Mad Men the other day, and um, they were throwing a dance for teenagers at the um, at the Catholic church in town. And um, uh, some of the organizers were saying that the dancers on the flyer were too close together. And the response was, they need to make room for the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you guys were ever told that when you went to church dances or not. I was Baptist. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I was Baptist, so we didn't dance. <laughs> Um, that's not what she's saying, but it is a kind of funny way to think about it. You have to make room for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to unite you and make sure that you don't dissolve your difference. You can't have ecstasy in some way unless you are also remaining inside of yourself. You are beside yourself with love, but you are also within yourself. Yourself isn't totally, it has to, well, there has to be some sort of self to be beside. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, that's, that's what the language is trying to stretch to. So, how are these desires chastened? What does that mean? It means they're put in a right order. They're put in a hierarchy. And this is what's odd about the account. Coakley comes in and she says, I'm going to make a defense of Dionysius' account, not only of the divine ecstasis, but also of his account of the hierarchy of the universe. Did you all know Pseudo-Dionysius, who we all love, was the person who coined the word hierarchy? It's a footnote in here. He made up the word. <laughs> hierarchy is something of a boogeyman, though, Coakley says. And the hierarchy that, um, that Dionysius has is a hierarchy of value, a hierarchy of being. Dionysius is a Platonist. There's just no getting around that. He's a Neoplatonic Christian. We talked about the differences between Neo, uh, Christians who tend in Neoplatonic versus in Aristotelian directions when we were comparing 
Thomas Aquinas and Bonaventure last year. If y'all remember. The thing about the thing about the Platonic worldview is it sees the world as being graded in being. Some things are just more real than others. That's what I mean, a universe that is gradated in being. This is an odd way to talk, but it's not an incomprehensible way to talk. For example, I gave a sermon a couple months ago about the different ways that I eat food, right? Eating Chipotle, watching Mad Men, is one way to eat dinner. It is in some way less real, though, than Thanksgiving dinner. That's the platonic sense. That's, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to explain why some things feel more really real. And, of course, the most really real real things for a Platonist are the, the, the realm of ideal forms. Um, for Dionysius, it's God. God is the really real thing. God is the form of truth, beauty, and goodness. Everything that comes, I don't want to say under, but it's hard to get over the idea of hierarchy as being like a ladder. Everything that comes under or after God is less real than God is. That's the world that Dionysius inhabits. So if you remember from when we kind of ran through the mystical theology, where Dionysius stages, as did Gregory of Nyssa, Moses' ascent of Mount Sinai. We started out by negating things that were most unlike God, things that were most clearly less real than God. We started by saying God is not a rock. God is not a drunk. Even though scripture talks about God as both a drunk and a rock. <laughs> but God is clearly not those things. They're less real. So he's, we didn't talk about this at the time, but what Dionysus is doing is he's starting at the very bottom of the hierarchy of the universe, this gradated order of being, and then he moves up through the hierarchy, and you end up negating everything, even being and non-being, even and similarity. You end up saying God is not... God cannot be, uh, God is not within the predicate of being or non-being. You know, negating everything. So he goes from the very bottom of the hierarchy all the way up to the top. That's what he was doing. The idea that I think Coakley wants to promote is that in entering into the Trinitarian life of God through this sort of ecstatic prayer, your desires are ordered according to that hierarchy, and thus ordered rightly. Things that are most real can take an awful lot of your desire. Things that are not, that are less real, are often incapable of taking all the desire that we pour out at them. So our desires are reordered. What I mean by reordered is they are ordered in accordance with the order of being that Dionysius just thinks is built into the universe. That is different from, an, from a hierarchy of power. Okay? A hierarchy of being is different from a hierarchy of power. And it is a hierarchy of power that, she says, feminists always have to resist. The translation of, say, a hierarchy within the trinity into a hierarchy within the church is what has to be avoided. And this has, this, such a hierarchy has been made. In Eastern Orthodoxy, for example, bishops mirror God the Father. That is the reason why they are bishops. The bishops image God the Father. So there's a direct Trinitarian translation of hierarchy within God into the church. That is the sort of thing that she says the feminist must always oppose. Not only in the church, but also in God. Hierarchy is not appropriate in God because of the creed. Because all the persons are considered to be co-equal. It would make no sense to say that the son is less real than the father. That would be awful. And yet you see theologians tempted in this direction all the time. Whether explicitly or implicitly. She's been trying to argue over the course of the book that theologians often 
say this sort of thing about the spirit. They make the spirit less real than the other two persons, right? So you have to resist hierarchy in the Trinity. You have to resist hierarchy in the church, a power hierarchy. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have gotten rid of hierarchy in all its senses. It doesn't mean you have, you've gotten rid of hierarchy in the sense of a hierarchy of desires. And that's the sort of hierarchy she wants to defend. So, ecstasy in God and in human creatures. Eros in God and in human creatures. We are trying to figure out how our Eros gets put into the crucible of God's Eros and is transformed. Our desires are reordered such that they match the hierarchy of being 